In these, the waning days of Babylon, as Eldridge Cleaver called them, <laughs> we have somehow redefined class, or rather the boss and, and mass media and the politicians have redefined class as income level. That's sloppy thinking. It doesn't work. Where does that slide to? No, class is defined as by your relationship to the means of production. If you don't own the machine you work at, if you don't own the tools you work with, don't own the workplace, if all you're selling is your labor energy to get a wage and a boss, you're in the working class, whether you're a college professor or a ditch digger, and that's that. Knowing that is class consciousness. The issues that you share between college professor and ditch digger in common and how, how they relate to the employer that's class analysis. How you act that out is class struggle. And we have to reestablish those definitions that are accurate, that really describe who we are, because they've been taken away from us. One thing no one foresaw was the rebellion of a number of young people today against the establishment. An establishment represented by their elders, as well as institutions like the news. The governor's proposed cuts to revenue sharing and to our school is going to create a race to the bottom, which guarantees many of our cities and schools are going to head into bankruptcy. How does this fit into the primary objective of jobs is job one? How does eliminating accountability to boards and councils better serve the taxpayer? How does this legislation promote the governor's mission of job one being jobs and ensuring that we have the innovators of tomorrow coming out of our schools? And how does this move all of Michigan forward, which we've heard the governor state over and over again? I mean, if you are a family or a business, would you choose a school district or a community that's in bankruptcy to locate in? How does this legislation entice businesses to come to Michigan? when the sanctity of contracts is not honored? How is paying an emergency financial manager more than what the governor makes shared sacrifice? I can't believe that some of my colleagues can honestly go back to their constituents and communities after taking this vote. This impacts 100 local communities with Governor Snyder's cuts to public safety via revenue sharing proposal. This impacts 160 school districts statewide with Governor Snyder's effort to slash our school. Many of these cities and schools are in your districts. How can you stand by and cast a vote like this? This bill gives managers the power to break contracts for services the state has required our cities provide, to undo collective bargaining, privatize government services, and lay off public employees with little supervision or accountability. Wisconsin's Governor Walker may be entering the front door on undoing workers' rights, but make no mistake, you all are sneaking in the back door to do the same thing with this vote. Who are you? My name is Bob, I'm from Flint. Well, I think we I think we need to be responsible in both our in our budgeting. Yes. Certainly. What kind of lesson do you think it teaches these kids here today to say that the economic problems that all states are facing are the problems of uh, their teachers um, and public workers? My what kind of lesson about education or justice or governance does that teach them? My responsibility is to the people of this state. You'll excuse me just a moment. Mike, why, why, uh, why are you here today? I'm here standing up for the American working men and women. We feel we're getting trampled on. We feel that the Republican majority in this state and other states are walking over our rights to protect our collective bargaining rights. We've got a hearing right now going on on the project labor agreements, which work on campuses, which get things built on time, under budget, efficiently, quality labor. We're trying to make those illegal. Later today, they're going to pass the emergency management financial bill. Emergency manager bill. They're looking to 
basically take away not only collective bargaining rights with that, but also take away local control from local governments to be able to basically appoint a SAR to any municipality, school district, and give him the power to do everything, to cut the public right out of the picture. You know, or not even an, an individual, uh, a consulting firm of some kind? No, a specific individual, as I understand it, the governor would be able to reach out to a specific individual from either the private sector or the public sector and tap him into running that municipality or that school district and have unlimited power to do what he wants with it. To get rid of contracts rid and of in contracts, school districts as well. To get rid of contracts, to get rid of busing services, to stop busing services, to eliminate sports programs, to eliminate police and fire in the cities, um, uh, severely restrict wastewater treatment plants to subcontract out power plants, wastewater treatment plants, and those types of things. What, uh, do you think that the the nature that that impact the, and the um, the potential to get rid of collective bargaining rights is, is well known among other Michigan citizens the way it is like in Wisconsin is it is it a little bit more uh, complex and hard to explain I mean why aren't there more people out in Michigan yeah, I think that the, the program here in Michigan that's being rolled out is a little bit. Uh, to say more uh, better hidden perhaps maybe a little bit better veiled than what they're what they're doing but it's the same general principle that's going on in Wisconsin they're attacking working men and women they're trying to push us down this affects union it affects non-union management non-management lower level managers it affects students. all of us as working people in this country that are getting trampled on and it's happening here in Michigan and it's just waking up in Michigan. Any, uh, anything you'd like to, uh, I don't know, say to people to get them to uh, join in the, a fight back? Oh. I would strongly urge all the working men and women in this state to get out and experience this. This is something that you will never experience before, you've never experienced before, and it'll be a long time before you experience it again. And if you don't get out, look to lose more of your houses and more of your cars. So Harold, what uh, brought you uh, from Flint to Lansing today? Well, the debate on project labor agreements. Okay. What uh, what would the impact for, for you and your members be? Well, project labor agreements make sure the people that work on these jobs in our communities are trained and they get the prevailing wage and it keeps the standard up. They pay taxes in the community. They don't 1099 us. We're tax paying members of the community. Right. And uh, tell me exactly how what there were, uh, this legislation would do would would change well, this that. legislation, if they allow untrained, unqualified people into the certain jobs, would be a race to the bottom. I mean, you'd have competition from down south who would come up here and work for less than minimum wage. They'd take their money home with them. They wouldn't spend it in the community, and everybody would lose. What uh, the the other piece of legislation is the emergency financial managers bill, which I, I suppose affects people unless you're uh, a city worker, more as a citizen, but even as a citizen or uh, a student, given the school district. Well, that would affect us too if they pass that emergency finance bill. That would allow them to up the bond rate because the, the counties would basically have to pay more interest and uh, we would lose a lot of work because of that. Besides getting rid of collective bargaining, if they wanted to, you know, give them the power to one person that, you know, at least people are elected by the community and one person shouldn't be able to come in and wipe all that out. Right, right. And even when the, you know, the so-called debt at the city level is still not really the workers' wages mo no, most often. No, they're, they're blaming the downturn on the economy on the workers and it wasn't the workers that caused this problem. I mean, I, I think of Mayor Stanley and Mayor Williamson and, and Flint we're a little bit more reckless with our uh, budget than any well, city worker. Flint lost 100,000 GM jobs. I mean, that's what killed that's Flint what killed right them. there. They shipped them to China. Right. These uh, Getting rid of PLA would be shipping these jobs to all these companies out of state. You'd kill Flint more. I mean, Flint has been down. We got 40% of unemployment for the last three years in the building trades. With the economy picking up, the work is picking up around, and uh, we need to make sure that it goes to local people. Right on. What would you say to uh, maybe more to the general public about why maybe they should uh, join this fight and why why it is their fight? Well, we are the general public. I mean, we're 
Our members go to school in Flint. I graduated from Flint Southwestern in 1979. Lived in Flint all my life. I mean, I was never in the UAW. I never got to work in the plants as a UAW member, but I've worked in the plants building them. Um, you know, that hurt us a lot when the GM went down. That hurt the building trades a lot. And these new projects that are coming up, the water pipeline, that would be the best thing for Flint ever because we would have a commodity at a cheap rate that we could entice more businesses to come into Flint. And I think, you know, anybody that opposes that bill is not looking at the big picture for Flint. Do you think that the emergency financial manager bill is an example of uh, sharing sacrifice? I think the emergency financial manager's bill is an attempt, and at this point a successful attempt, by the government of the state of Michigan to hire cronies to effectuate terrorism, gangsterism, and hooliganism that dates back past the date that the unions were organized. They are destroying our rights, taking away our benefits. People who are elderly and seniors have no hope with the governor signing this bill. This isn't just in those states or in those cities and towns that have issues financially. This affects the whole state. It's not people who are union or non-union. This is impacting everybody. So. It's down to the wire. We are in dire doo-doo. Anytime you work on uh, destroying uh, things that are associated with collective bargaining and removing the middle class, um, certainly that's of concern to all of us, all of us uh, citizens in the U.S., and certainly now at this point, all of the citizens of Michigan. To disenfranchise voters, to kick elected officials out of office, and to tear up bargain agreements, not the way to go, it's un-American. So what uh, brings you to the Capitol today? today? Uh, to stand in protest of the Senate Bill 24, 14, and 18. Those are the uh, what, the uh, emergency financial manager bill yes. and the uh, what was it the worksite bill that was different. That's later. That's later. Yes, yeah, three o'clock. The PLA thing. The PLA, correct. Yep. So what? What do you think the impact is going to be uh, with the emergency financial manager bill having just passed? I can see it being really bad eventually. They come in, take away the teachers' rights, the firefighters, the police officers, take away their rights for collective bargaining, to, uh, to negotiate a fair wage, to come in and cut their wages at whatever the financial manager seems fit to be. I, I, I can't see where you can justify that. To where the financial manager can make $400,000 a year, and he's decided on the wages of thirty to $50,000 a year salaries. It's, it's almost like make-believe way. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And again, I, earlier, when the Wall Street bailouts come, and the Wall Street received their bonuses, they were screaming, we got contracts, you owe us this money, it's ours. Right. There's contractual agreements that will stand up. And you have to you have to hold these things up because they're they're signed by both sides and it's due us. Yeah. Not now. To where they can come in and decide that because of the law now that you're you guys are in financial trouble and we can take away your collective bargaining and cut your pay, but yet we got ours. It's not, uh, I was uh, asking one of the senators, he didn't really give me an answer, but, uh, you know, the kids who are here touring today, what kind of lesson to, that, to them is that about equal sacrifice and true justice when we know where the root of the problem is yeah. and look what we're doing about it. When, when you give $1.3 billion in tax cuts to big business and expect the retirees in the state to carry that load when they're fit on a fixed income already. Raise their taxes. Yeah. yeah. Great, great, yeah. My dad retired from GL and his monthly payment's $2,800 a month. You know? How you dare want, he? <laughs> and, and you want, yeah. Yeah, it's where they're making, they say they're making hundreds of thousands of dollars on retirement. It's false. Right. It's not even close. Yeah, and the older they are, the pension the payout is. is less. Yeah. Yep. 
Yeah, these guys that retired 10 years ago that are making $1,500, $1,200 a month in retirement wage. Or even old timers I've heard get as little as like 500 in, in yeah. a pension. Yeah. I mean, come on. Yep. And, and at, at that point, you know, when are we going to say enough's enough? We start, we got to, we got the working poor is what we have anymore. Mm -hmm. And they want to justify their wages and all that by cutting down everyone else's. Mm -hmm. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the multinational corporations and to the profit for which they stand, one interlocking directorate under no government, indivisible with monopoly and cheap labor for all. So we can't tax ourselves into prosperity. Okay. But why are we raising taxes on fixed income people? I'm not convinced we are. Well, isn't that one? Of, isn't that the proposal? That's what the governor proposed. Yes. Okay. Can I ask you about? Um, do you think like these emergency financial manager situations create tension between rural and urban? And if so, how does that? Is that good for Michigan's future? I don't think that there's a correlation between urban and rural. I think we're all suffering from some of the same economic conditions. Right on. Yeah. Um, do you think that the, this bill is, is uh, an example of shared sacrifice? Um, I think what it is, it's a recognition that maybe the old way of doing business isn't going to be viable into the future. I think that maybe we've got to take a look at some of our practices and make them as best as possible. Well, I mean, it's pretty clear that the blame is for places like Bank of America, and it doesn't really seem fair that uh, public workers and teachers have to pay the bill for that. I mean, can you understand that that reaction people have? Well, you know, I think that there's got to be a, a better understanding of what we're trying to do, and that is economic stability going forward. And, uh, you know, I think maybe it'll start some conversations now that are maybe overdue. About collective bargaining? No, about uh, just the way that we operate local and state government. I think there's an examination from top to bottom underway. And we want to be able to continue to offer education, continue to offer the police and fire protection at home for the dollars that we have to spend on it. I mean, I appreciate it. it. I got to. Okay. because they had a part in making the decision. All politicians are crooked. Everything's fixed. What are your facts, girls? We just know, that's all. Everybody knows it. Hey, do you have any facts to prove your point? I'm sorry. There comes a time when the operation of the machine is so odious that you cannot even tacitly participate. You've got to place your bodies on the gears, the wheels, all the mechanism, and you've got to indicate to those who own it and those who run it that unless you are free, the machine will be prevented from working at all. <laughs> 